going to be the oral history of Jerry Mize. We're here in Las Vegas at the Colorado River Water Users Association meeting. It's December 12, 2001. Jerry, I think most people would think about your involvement in Colorado River matters and think instantly to your involvement in the Arizona-California litigation. Can you tell us how you first became involved in the case? Well, I guess I'd first say how I happened to be out at Stanford Law School, which is where I met Mike Ely, uh, who got me involved in all this originally. But I had happened, I had, I'm a Pennsylvanian by uh, basic residency for so many years. My wife and I both are. And we happened to come out to Stanford because a, a good friend of mine at Princeton ran into Bill Norris, who was a Princeton grad and who had worked for Mike Ely on the Colorado River litigation in the early 50s, and then uh, Bill later came out to California and became a Ninth Circuit uh, judge and is now retired, I think. But anyhow, my wife and I decided to come out uh, west of Stanford, which we did, and I believe it was the, uh, my, uh, the summer of my, between my second and third year at Stanford that Mike Ely came down to interview students for a summer clerk's position with the California Attorney General's office, not with Mike's firm. Mike had been hired by uh, then Attorney General Pat Brown to be special assistant Attorney General to handle the Colorado River case, which Arizona had filed in 1952. And Mike interviewed a number of us, and I was very impressed with Mike, and I was very fascinated with the litigation and with the job of clerking on it. The, the trial was going to be starting, and this was the summer of 56. I think the trial was going to be starting up in San Francisco that summer, and so I thought this would be an exciting thing to do. And also the pay was pretty good for a, a state deputy, I think I was called uh, attorney general, even though I was just a clerk. So uh, I told Mike I was interested, and he hired me. And uh, that summer, we started the trial up in uh, San Francisco in 1956. And I did a lot of the mundane things that uh, summer law clerks do, research and so forth. But I got to meet a lot of the people who stayed throughout the whole litigation. But that's how it all started. Did you work? Then in your final year of law school, or did you well, just after work I, in the summer? And after I graduated, uh, I had, Mike then offered me a, a permanent job with his law firm back in Washington to be preceded by me working from the beginning of the summer of 57 when the trial was again ongoing up in San Francisco. Mike wanted me to uh, go on the Attorney General's payroll, which I did until I passed the bar and in January of 58, and Mike hired me for his firm. We just stayed, my wife and I stayed out in California. We moved down to Pasadena for a year and then eventually didn't go back to Washington until October of 1958. And then I was a member of Mike's firm and working under the same contract with Pat Brown that, that Mike uh, had with his state. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the individuals that were involved? You start with the California folks. Well, the uh, of course the top individual was Pat Brown, who was <laughs> a very gregarious uh, Irishman. He used to come through the uh, the temple. Well, first of all, there was a special litigation section set up in the Attorney General's office to handle just the Colorado River litigation. It was uh, it was headed by uh, Gil Nelson was an assistant attorney general, I believe that would have been his title, down in L.A., and Pat Brown put him in charge of the uh, this Colorado River group. But Mike Ely, even though he was a contract special assistant attorney general, was really running the show. I mean, he was in charge, and, and Gil was a very amiable, pleasant guy. Actually, I recall he was a, a cousin of Ray Bolger. He told me, and he looked, if you ever knew Gil Nelson, he looked very much like Ray Bolger. But uh, Gil was kind of the nominal head of the office, but Mike was the uh, uh, really in charge. That's the way Pat Brown wanted it. Mike hired a number of other outside uh, attorneys to be 
special assistants in that unit. The principal one was Charlie Corker, who had been a, a uh, who was a Harvard Law School graduate and had taught at Stanford for a while. And Mike bumped into him somehow in the course of uh, the course of putting this special team together. And he was very impressed with Charlie. And uh, Charlie left the Stanford faculty and uh, went on this case and sought through the end indeed stayed with the Attorney General's office after Arizona against California was finished in 64 for a while before he went up to uh, the University of Washington to teach at the law school there. Uh, other people that were hired, two I remember were Howard Friedman, I'm not sure where Howard came from but he, he later became, he, he didn't stay too long with that special unit. He went to practice, into practice with Loeb and Loeb, where I think Melissa is a, a partner now. And uh, Bert Gindler came in from, I think responded to an ad in the paper and came in from Minnesota and joined that special unit same summer I did, 56. Bert may have preceded me by a little bit. But Bert stayed for the duration also and then he subsequently went into in the private practice with uh, Seth Huffstetler and Shirley Huffstetler's firm. I've forgotten what the name was at the time. I think he's still with them in some subsequent firm. Uh, then some, those were lawyers brought in on a permanent status in the special unit and other people kind of worked part-time. I think Bill Norris again was on a, a special contract that Mike had with him to help on the case. Shirley Huffstetler became a very integral part of, the, of that team, although she wasn't part of the permanent litigation group. Was she working in the AG's office generally? Or? No, she was in private practice, oh, okay. but she had a contract with uh, Pat Brown and it was kind of part-time. She would, we had our we, we had the trial up in San Francisco, but there was a special office for the Colorado River litigation down in Los Angeles at 9th and Broadway, which I think was actually the headquarters of the Colorado River Board at that time. We were sharing space, or had adjacent space to the Colorado River Board, uh, Board's offices there. There were a couple other young lawyers about my vintage that were hired. One was Andy Chaudhry, who was a, a native of India and had just graduated from law school back here and was interested in water issues and he was hired for several years Then he moved on and went back to Indria, India. Uh, Harry Sondheim was just hired and worked pretty much for the duration of the, the litigation. John Alexander was hired as a Department of Justice employee in that special unit and went through the to the duration of the uh, litigation and he became as I recall a Superior Court judge, maybe Municipal Court judge in, in Los Angeles. And there was one other uh, lawyer whose name escapes me who wasn't there too long but that was kind of it. You had Mike Ely uh, brought in as special counsel to be the head of the team, Gil Nelson the nominal head of the team and a full-time Department of Justice assistant. And then the special people Mike hired, Charlie Corker, Shirley, the rest of us. And we all had, we had titles as we were State Department of Justice employees during that short period until I left and went with Mike's firm and I was just acting under the contract Mike had with Pat Brown. And how did this, <clears throat> this particular team then interact with the California agencies all had their general counsels or special counsels, I think, who were also involved right. in the case. Well, it was, as I look back, it was rather hard. I think logistically it was hard to coordinate everything. Mike and Charlie Corker, I think, pretty much had that responsibility. Uh, Imperial was represented by Harry Horton and by his, I believe, son-in-law, Reggie Knox. Uh, Palo Verde was represented by Frank Jenny, Coachella by uh, Earl Redwine, um, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power by uh, oh, 
very funny, Gilmore Tillman. And uh, who else would we have? Metropolitan. Metropolitan was uh, Jim Cooper. And they would, those were the principal players. Uh, <coughs> they all had their individual personalities. Some were more dynamic and effective than others. I think uh, most of them took Mike Ely's lead. Mike would kind of come out with strategic proposals and so forth. and, and either by correspondence or on the phone, or in most cases on important matters with actual meeting with all the agency council and work out positions. I suppose that, I think all of them went along pretty, pretty readily. The, the one who was more independent, and I'd say a little feisty maybe, was Harry Horton, because Harry was Imperial's council and was, was well along in years and, and quite a reputation, I think, in the state as a water lawyer. So he wouldn't always see uh, eye to eye on things that Mike wanted to do. It may have been that there were ten there were tensions then even between Imperial and, and Metropolitan that I wasn't aware of, you know, so that maybe Harry would see uh, issues lurking in some positions the state was taking that might come back to uh, bite Imperial, and so he was kind of more cautious, and I'd say not as easily, uh, or more, not as likely to come along immediately on most of the, the group's positions as some of the other lawyers. Since you were sharing space with the Colorado River Board, did the the board have much of an influence? Oh, no, they had. They were case? they were our technical people. Uh, Ray Matthews was. I guess I don't know if he was called executive director then, but he he was the equivalent of of uh, Jerry Zimmerman at the time, and <clears throat> then the board had a lot of, I think, many more engineers than they uh, do now. They may have beefed up their staff specifically for the litigation. Uh, Gil Lee, for example, was one of the engineers. I think Gil later went on to uh, law school and worked for L.A. Department of Water and Power for a number of years, and maybe he still does, or maybe he's old enough to retire by now. Um, I'd say uh, we all got along very well. It was a lot of camaraderie. They were very helpful. A, a lot of the engineers were very able. They didn't have to do very difficult things. When we got into uh, developing the water supply phase of the case, Tom Stetson came down on, I think, on assignment or whatever you want to call it from the Department of Water Resources up in Sacramento and was assigned to uh, the Arizona against California litigation, became our top expert on water supply and actually uh, later testified on that issue. And by the way, that was a great, great part of our case we developed and the special master ultimately just ignored it completely and said water supply was completely irrelevant to the case and uh, a great deal of time, effort and money went down the tubes on that, uh, on that issue. Did you have other technical experts that were brought in from the outside? Yes, I think we brought in Raymond Hill, who was an old friend of Mike's and who was a very prominent uh, hydrologist, I guess. He uh, was with a firm, as I recall, Leeds Hill and Jewett. Now I see there's a firm called C CH2OM CH Hill. Hill or whatever, and I assume that Hill is Raymond Hill, although I don't know. But he, uh, he also testified on water supply, and uh, we never got to know him very much. He was kind of a, a pompous fellow, and uh, I think Mike told me, uh, Mike Ely told me one time that someone said that Raymond Hill was the only person he ever knew who could strut sitting down, <laughs> so, which I, I thought was an apt characterization of Raymond. Oh, he was a, quite a brilliant engineer. Did Pat Brown himself get involved very much in the case? Or? Not really. I remember him coming through the uh, office up in uh, San Francisco during the trial on several occasions, and he was very humorous. He came in, he talked to me and shook hands and, you know, chit-chatted, and it was real, as he always was, the impression I had, you know, a real politician, man of the people, and, I mean, so unlike his son who I met later, who, when he was practicing with the with Bill Norris's firm in Los Angeles for a while. And Jerry Brown was there, he was always kind of a very serious, got not much, uh, not much light-heartedness uh, in, in Jerry, unlike his dad. 
Um, did were you all assigned to work on different different issues? Well, we had an overall strategy. We knew what the issues were that were had been uh, uh, identified and that we we're working on. I think as a young lawyer, I got. I got to do a lot of research on different issues, and, and at one point I was assigned <laughs> these two boundary cases, the Fort Mojave and uh, Colorado River boundary disputes, because there was a fair amount of water involved, and, and so uh, Mike uh, and Charlie Corker gave me that assignment, which was good for a very young lawyer. I put the whole case together and tried it and everything, so it was a big thrill for me and good experience. I probably would have never gotten anything that kind of experience that soon after graduating from law school, as I did uh, working on, in the special Colorado River unit. Uh, the, uh, I think they would parcel pieces of research out, but Charlie Corker and, and all the people I mentioned pretty much uh, zeroed in on particular issues. For example, John Alexander and Harry Sondheim did most of the research on the Indian water rights issue and the reserve rights and so forth. Uh, I did a lot of work on the legislative history of the Boulder Canyon Project Act. Mike, of course, would, would do the outlines of briefs and make the strategic decisions which the other council would go along on about how we were going to treat these issues. But uh, certainly issues on the on the compact, meaning we all thought at that point that the compact somehow was relevant to the litigation with the special master uh, disagreed with that ultimately. But Mike and Charlie would decide uh, how we were going to attack these issues and then they might make assignments to Bert Gindler, Howard Friedman. They were a little more senior than I was I, and I'd get different pieces to work on. But uh, And then Shirley was hired as I say and Bill Norris were special targeted issues. They might hire specific lawyers on a contract basis to work on on issues that they might need rather speedily or if they thought those lawyers might have some special expertise on. But I think uh, all in all, all the personnel were used uh, quite efficiently. It's my recollection that the, the age met in many cases, Metropolitan would, would sometimes file an independent brief and sometimes uh, imperial, but by and large, most of our efforts were kind of uh, joint briefs that everyone would join in. And uh, I don't recall that maybe beyond uh, the contributions Harry Horton made, and to a lesser extent Jim Cooper, that, that we ever got much in the way of work product. Uh, from the agency. Now, of course, when we put on our, our affirmative case, eventually we all thought it was an equitable apportionment case, so we all had to, we thought we had to prove our water rights. So, of course, Frank Jenny put on the Palo Verde case, and Harry Orton put on the Imperial case, and Jim Cooper, Metropolitan, and so forth. So, we're, when the individual agency cases were put on with respect to their water rights, whether they were state water rights or like metropolitan contract water rights, then the agency council took the lead, but I'd say everything pretty much beyond that was under the direction of Mike and Charlie and Gil Nelson technically and uh, the work assignments were spread around the, the lawyers and the special units. So to that extent, I don't think the agency lawyers made a particularly uh, large contribution to the, the broader issues. Tell us about the, your Arizona counterparts. Oh, see, I'm trying to think. The uh, Arizona started out with a, a particular lawyer. I think his name was Black. He may have been the Black who later went on to be a Yale Law professor or had been a Yale Law School professor. But he he was representing uh, Arizona in the early stages of the. Uh, the proceeding representing the state of Arizona. They had the same agency problems as we did because you had a number of Arizona uh, irrigation districts who were involved and who, some of whom had uh, water rights in the, <coughs> excuse me, the mainstream like Yuma and Welton Mohawk and some of those agencies. But there was uh, one lawyer, very able, I can't remember his first name, his last name was Black, and in the uh, 
sometime in the early stages of the proceeding, he came up with the, uh, the theory that this was not an equitable apportionment case along the traditional lines of those the Supreme Court had decided in the past, but that it was really a, a unique case in which the contract should control everyone, the three states at least, water rights. And uh, it's my recollection that that was such a radical proposition that it, uh, and he didn't purport to, he didn't want to rely extensively on a traditional equitable apportionment case where each district would present its evidence of its water rights and needs and things of that sort. And I think that so alarmed a number of the council for the districts and maybe even other council for the state that I believe he was fired. Actually, and they brought Mark Wilmer in from Snell and Wilmer now, I guess is the name of the firm, and Mark came in. He was a very prominent trial lawyer. I don't know if he was a water lawyer, but uh, he pretty much uh, reverted to the traditional presentation that would be made in equitable portion of the case. But as it turned out later on, it's my recollection, as we got to the final briefing and everything uh, before the special master, he reverted back to the, uh, the contractual allocation theory that his predecessor had been fired for espousing, and as you know, that turned out to be the winning rationale before the special master. Everything we did in the way of uh, what we thought were all the supporting evidence we needed to show an ironclad priority for the California users under traditional equitable apportionment principles. So, were just ignored by the special master and the Supreme Court. And the special master and the court ultimately held that contract, the, the Congress had authorized the secretary to make a contractual allocation among the three states, and that in fact he had done so by all of our water delivery contracts. So, Tell us about the special master. Well, the special master, Simon H. Rifkin of uh, Paul Weiss, Rifkin, and Garrison, New York. Well, he wasn't the first special master. Before I came to the case, uh, early, the suit was filed in 52, and early on, I think uh, the defendants, the California defendants, moved to join the upper basin states. And about that time, the Supreme Court uh, appointed a special master named Haight, H-A-I-G-H-T. It may have been George Haight. And, uh, uh, he decided, as I recall, the uh, joinder, so-called joinder motion, and, uh, and rejected the idea that the upper basin states were indispensable parties for this lawsuit, and they, a number of them had not intervened, so we hoped, I think, I wasn't there at the time, I think the hope was that the suit would go down the tubes because of the indispensability of, of those upper basin states. But he rejected uh, that argument, so did the Supreme Court, and then he died shortly after the joinder decision, and I think Rifkin probably was appointed about uh, 1954 or 55 and came on, and as I say, they had some pre-trial hearings. This was before I was involved, but beginning in the summer of, of 1956, he, he uh, scheduled the trial for San Francisco, and that's where we uh, tried the whole matter. He was a prominent New York City lawyer, not with no familiarity to with water issues or anything. And he had been a federal district judge and retired sometime, I think, in the early 50s because he said he had, uh, as I recall, as I was told at least, he had a lot of uh, children in college and so forth. District judge, judges didn't make much money then. He wanted to get in private practice, which he did. But somehow he was very well respected in the in the bar, and uh, someone in, at the Supreme Court thought obviously thought highly of him and appointed him a special master, as I say, about in '55. Uh, he was uh, he was kind of a somewhat arrogant uh, man. He was never in doubt about himself, and he and Mike Ely would often kind of two of a kind, they would often uh, have little exchanges in the courtroom, but uh, 
Rifkin was uh, very brilliant, obviously very brilliant, always cut right through the heart of the issues and everything. But uh, as I say, he was never in doubt as he moved along and so forth. And he conducted the, the hearings very expeditiously and I think very fairly. And effectively, he would often sit with his, uh, we'd be in the courtroom. We had, the trial was held in the, I think it was the then post office building up in San Francisco, just off the corner of Market Street, about maybe 9th and Market. And we had a big room there that they made, it, it's either a federal building, or I believe it was a post office, and they made this big room available for the trial. He'd often sit in his swivel chair up on the platform with his back to the, all the lawyers as they would be doing their direct and, and cross uh, examination and you always wondered whether he was asleep or whatever but he would in critical times he'd spin around in his chair and inject himself but uh, I always thought that was quite amusing <laughs> like he was a little a unnerving yes he wondered whether he was hearing any of this and so forth but uh, he was a small man and uh, you know Maybe that was part of what shaped his uh, personality, because he was very aggressive and uh, very intelligent, and uh, everyone certainly respected him, and he was highly respected in the uh, in the legal community in New York. And he had a law clerk, right? Or at least, uh, not a law clerk, but he had yes, a, someone he, to assist him. Uh, the him. law clerk, the first one I remember was Charlie Myers, who later became uh, on, uh, part of the Stanford faculty and later Dean became a very good friend of mine, but I met Charlie during the course of the proceedings for the special master. Charlie had been a uh, prominent oil and gas lawyer down at the uh, University of Texas Law School. And then he moved up to Columbia. And I, don't, I can't recall what Charlie was teaching. I doubt if he was teaching oil and gas law up at, at Columbia, but he was teaching somehow Charlie never told me how he got hired by Judge Rifkin to be his clerk, but I'm guessing that Rifkin wanted to get some sharp young professors to help him, and he may have just made an inquiry at Columbia. Maybe Rifkin went to Columbia for all I know. But he hired Charlie, and Charlie was uh, the mainstay of his uh, staff. He was his principal clerk. Toward the end of the trial, uh, he brought in another lawyer from New York, who I think was a member of his firm, Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Garrison, a fellow named Fishbein. But other than that, I don't think that Judge Rifkin had any other clerks. So Charlie was very effective. He'd come out with the judge, and of course he'd do a lot of the work in the, uh, in the interim periods between the hearings on for Judge Rifkin, and uh, was a brilliant guy. And uh, when he, he finally moved out to Stanford from Columbia, I'd say in the 60s sometime, and then stayed on there as they became dean, and then uh, left uh, Stanford and went with the uh, uh, Los Angeles firm. It wasn't uh, it was Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher in their uh, Denver office, and was appointed special master in in the so-called Pecos River original action in which uh, New Mexico had sued uh, Texas. Charlie did a very good job in that, and then he died at a re relatively early age, I'd say about 1990, from uh, pretty much lung cancer and, and heart problems associated with it. He was a voracious smoker. I mean, he really smoked out if you were spending any time with him. So a word of caution to smokers, but uh, that uh, that was his principal clerk, and as they say, Fishbein came on to, have, to help at the end, but I'm guessing uh, Judge Rifkin probably had some of his uh, associates in his law firm do, you know, research for him, and more mundane things, but Charlie Myers was his right, right arm, pretty much. And the U.S., who, who represented the U.S.? Well, we were just talking at lunch here at uh, well, we're in the pavilion because uh, uh, let's see, there was there was a couple of Arizona lawyers there and uh, Mike Clinton. And we were talking about Bill Veter, the notorious Bill Veter, who had been in the U.S. Justice Department. Had, he was the original lawyer 
representing the government when Arizona filed the lawsuit in 52, and he had also been at that, he also at that time was a government lawyer in the so-called Fallbrook case, where he, he made the outrageous assertion that the federal government had some kind of paramount, as I recall, authority over all the water <laughs> in the West, and they could do whatever they wanted without regard to state law or anything. And, uh, that was in the early 50s when Eisenhower, the Eisenhower administration uh, took over in 1953. Veeder was fired from, those, from the spot as the government's lawyer in Arizona against California and shipped over to the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, by and large. He was kind of sent to Siberia because his, uh, his view of federal supremacy and water rights was not one that found any favor at the uh, at the Justice Department, although it's strange that the ultimate victory the uh, Justice got out of Arizona against California was an all-federal rationale. But the two lawyers that took over were Dave Warner and Walter Keechel. And they were, uh, I think they were both from Nebraska. And they were protégés of the Solicitor General at the time, whose name was Rankin, and when he when he took over as Solicitor General at Justice, he brought Dave Warner and, and Walter Keechel in from uh, whatever, I think they'd been private practice in Nebraska, and they really ran the litigation with help from individual Interior Department lawyers. The client, of course, was the Secretary of the Interior and the, the agencies there, the BIA and Bureau of Reclamation and so forth. And he, those two justice lawyers would often have uh, assistance from those Interior Department lawyers. But uh, they were both very staid kind of conservative lawyers. Uh, uh, Dave Warner talked very slowly and if, you know, if you were sitting in a a uh, summer afternoon up in San Francisco when he was examining some a witness, why you might well doze off because he, the judge, Judge Rifkin would often have to try and let's move it along, you know, uh, Mr. Warner. And, and Keechel was more dynamic and a little more feisty uh, than uh, Warner was very placid and, as I say, stayed. Keechel was kind of more aggressive and active and uh, Mike Ely used to get under both of their skins. I mean, they'd be, you know, presenting direct testimony by a witness or crossing them, and Mike would always be coming in with little kind of nitpicking objections or needling them because he knew he could disrupt them, and they would, Warner would get f flustered a little bit but kind of maintain his cool, whereas Keechel would get all kind of feisty and fire. And, I, and Walter is still alive. I, I see Walter periodically, and he calls me, he called me after our oral argument in Arizona against California in April of whenever that was, uh, 2000, I guess. And uh, they, uh, you know, you would, you would not have thought that they would have been able to put together the, the amazing victory they did in the lawsuit, but they did. And uh, they, were, they were good lawyers, they had good pedigrees from law schools and Keechel went on later on. Dave Warner, I think, retired and and died at an earlier age, as they say. Walter's still around, but Walter stayed on for some time. Then he became a an environmental lawyer for a, a international paper, something I see him periodically at the American Bar Association Water Law Conference down in San Diego. But uh, those two guys pulled off a major a major victory for the government. Now, at, <clears throat> at this time, the Indian reservations didn't have separate representation as, as they've had in um, subsequent iterations of the case. Right? No, that's but, right. In fact, I think, uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the Navajo tribe tried to intervene and they were denied intervention. That was Norman Littell, who was a very prominent Washington lawyer, represented a lot of Indian tribes. They never got into the case. I don't know that... The, I don't know that anyone else ever tried to assert a right to represent the tribes independently. That was kind of a transitional period. The, the law had always been that when the government is in a, in a case involving uh, 
Indians, why the Attorney General has complete authority, whatever he wants to do is binding on, on the government and on the tribes. Somewhere along the way, as a matter of policy, I think uh, the United States decided to let the tribes, if they wanted, to have their own independent council and to try and help them fund that council to some limited degree. And so that's what has evolved today. And as you know, in, in Arizona, too, each of the tribes had their own uh, independent council. And now in, our, in the final stages of the dispute down the Fort Hume Indian Reservation, they have their independent council. The government is also there on behalf of the tribes, it's sort of in a backup role. The, the government lawyers, justice lawyers, and the tribal lawyers really have to reach agreement, and I think by and large, unless there's some outrageous position that a, a tribal attorney would want to be taking on a, an issue that would be prejudicial to other Indian claims or to the government's interest in the subject matter, why they pretty much defer to the, the council the tribes have hired. That's what's evolved over the years. Tell us a little bit about how um, Rifkin's opinion came to be. I think there, there was a, a draft at one point and the parties were allowed to comment. That's right. And then a final. Now, were you all surprised by the draft opinion or did you kind of have clues along the way? I don't think any of us had a clue that the draft opinion was going to be the way it was. I remember when it came out, I think it was this dated December 5th, 1960, or maybe that was the final opinion, but the judge said he wanted to give us a draft opinion, and uh, he told us then that we would get a chance to comment on it, and he would prepare a final opinion. I can't, I can't remember whether it was the draft opinion or the special master's final opinion. I kind of think it was the final opinion that Mike Ely sent me up to to York, Pennsylvania, where it was being printed, so that when it, as soon as it came off the press, I got a box of them and drove them back to Washington. But the, the draft opinion was a complete shock, I think, to everybody, because we were so convinced, Californians were convinced, and Nevada was convinced, I think, but Arizona was taking a long shot. We were so convinced that the case would be decided on traditional principles of equitable apportionment, and we had put in a good case about our senior water rights and the magnitude of them, and we had put in, the court had indicated in earlier cases that available water supply would be kind of matched against uh, requirements of the states, and that would be a factor. So we had all this evidence we tried to put in that uh, about the water supply, but we did put it in. We had a voluminous record. It's just that in the draft report, the special master said it was all irrelevant and everything we had proved about our water rights was irrelevant because Congress had, in fact, uh, authorized the secretary to make a uh, contractual allocation of the waters of the first seven and a half million acre feet of the, the waters in the mainstream of the lower basin. That, in fact, he had done so through the Arizona and Nevada master contracts and through the collective individual contracts with the California agencies, and that was the allocation. Well, we, and of course he bought 100% all the government claims for Indian tribes, and that was the first time the, uh, the magnitude of Indian claims uh, was set at practically irritable acreage. We all knew of the winner's doctrine and that there was such a thing as a, an implied water right for Indian reservations. But the magnitude had been determined under a number of different formulas, and we, argued, California, argued for giving the tribe the maximum amount, each tribe the maximum amount they had ever used on the reservation, plus some modest kicker, maybe another 10 or 15 percent. And uh, Arizona argued that the, uh, the uh, decree ought to be left open, just give the tribes what they're using now, and if they ever need, need more water, they can come in later. But the government asserted that uh, it would be best for the tribes if you took a look at all the practically irrigable acreage on the reservation and gave them enough water to satisfy those requirements, and then each reservation's need would be determined for all time. They wouldn't have to come back to the court. Everyone would have certainty as to what the magnitude of the rights were. And uh, we were surprised by we weren't as 
much surprised by that because we knew that the government had been arguing that, but the, uh, the idea of the contractual allocation, which the government picked up on too, so they were kind of <coughs> siding with Arizona's uh, initiative on that. But that was, that just stunned all of us and we, we really uh, tried hard to get that turned around. Uh, we were given a chance to comment on the uh, draft report. We wrote official comments to the special master, then we had two days of hearings before him in New York at the, uh, at the federal building, the federal courthouse in downtown Manhattan. And uh, uh, he may have changed a few things in the draft report, but not much, only things to kind of correct minor errors he might have had, but the, the fundamental uh, principles of his report weren't changed at all. Now, um, what was the reaction of the California clients, <laughs> so to speak? <laughs> oh. Well, I don't know. It's, uh, I remember Mike Ely uh, gave a speech at what was then called Town Hall in downtown Los Angeles. I don't know if that group is still around or not, but uh, uh, I helped, uh, I mean, I didn't conceptualize the speech, but I helped work on everything. And, th and I think on that, I always remember this, and Mike, in a way, tried to characterize it as a victory of some sort <laughs> for uh, California, which was, I think, quite a stretch. But uh, I think everyone was shocked. You couldn't, you couldn't say we had, uh, the case had not been uh, strategically well-planned or implemented. I think we had a wonderful record and our briefs, I think, were, were great. And if you just think about the way the, the Supreme Court's final decision came down, which was about five to three. Um, uh, when you got justices like Justice Douglas and, uh, and Justice Harlan coming down on our side, the two philosophically uh, different justices by about 180 degrees, I think uh, you read that dissent, they were right on target, and I think that's the way everyone thought that case should have been decided. Um, it was uh, it was pretty startling to us. I heard later, by the way, that uh, uh, might be interesting. But Mike told me that you know we had the oral argument before the Supreme Court, and it was the longest one on record at that time. I think, except for <coughs> maybe the civil rights cases, but it was like 16 or 17 hours. And then uh, the uh, uh, they recessed for the summer, I guess, and then over the uh, summer, two justices retired. I think it was Frank Twitter and maybe Burton, I can't remember. And they were replaced by, uh, I believe, Goldberg and Byron White. Uh, so when they reconvened in the fall, they rescheduled oral argument because they had two new justices would replace the two retiring justices. And we had something like nine additional hours then on re-argument. And Mike told me once that Frankfurter told him that uh, after the first argument, when the court went back in and did their straw vote, as they usually do about how they're going to, how they see the case, that California had prevailed five to three. But with uh, Frankfurter and Burton retiring white and Goldberg came on and they went in the opposite direction, so the ultimate uh, decision was against us on a five to three basis. So it's just a, such a quirk of fate that the timing was such that the decision could not have been rendered before two justices who were on our side had, had retired. Had there been any settlement discussions amongst the parties during the duration of the case? I, I don't think there were ever any settlement discussions. I think uh, there may well have been. I, uh, if there were, I don't remember them getting much prominence uh, around the office. Mike was very convinced of the, you know, the, that we had the strong case and were destined to win, and I think everyone else on the case felt the same way. And if, if there were any suggestions for settlement, uh, I'm sure when Mike talked to Pat Brown about it, he told him he would 
probably recommend against it. In my later years working with Mike, he was never one interested particularly in settling cases. Uh, you know, Mike had a was a brilliant guy and had a pretty strong ego, and I think he felt that he was correct in, on most of the the uh, representation he undertook for a client. And certainly, if you look at the kind of case we put on uh, uh, under his direction and uh, measured them against the Supreme Court precedents at the time, it looked like we did all the right things and had an ironclad victory. I think. I think we felt, I remember we used to talk about it, Mike and Charlie and all of us afterward, kind of post-mortem, that we wondered if uh, somehow California might not have been prejudiced by marching into court every day with, you know, Mike and the entourage of state lawyers and then the five agencies with their entourage of their own lawyers. I mean, California lawyers and engineers dominated the the space in the hearing room. And, you know, there's California with Mark Wilmer and a couple other lawyers and and poor Dave Warner and Walter Keechel just by themselves. So it, it looked like kind of David and Goliath, you know, we were coming in with all the the, the power and the money and, and everything. And we often wondered whether somehow that uh, influenced the judge and trying to figure out some way that he could help poor struggling Arizona in, in this dispute and which led him to think of this unique uh, interpretation of the Boulder Canyon Project Act that he finally uh, settled on. Did you guys have any idea that your oral argument was going to take, I mean, that you were going to be given so much time? I mean, preparing for that oral argument must have just been an enormous mm -hmm. task. Well, I think we, uh, I think we weighed pretty carefully, uh, looking at all the briefs and all the issues, and, and of course that the the, uh, the federal contractual allocation scheme had only been sprung on us, you know, in the draft report, so we had never researched that or, or were prepared to argue why it was completely off the wall and and why you had to, to, uh, to uh, take a hard look at water supply. These were all kind of givens before, so uh, I think we made a, a you know, a good assessment of what we needed, and each of the agencies wanted to have something to say. I don't think, I don't think each agency counsel argued. I'd have to go look at that, but Mike carried the ball pretty much. Imperial may have, Harry Horton may have had something to say, and on some of them, maybe Jim Cooper, uh, if they had a unique issue or something. But uh, we, uh, I think we made a good showing about why we needed so much time, and these were major, major issues setting a broad new precedent on interstate water allocation, Indian water rights. And of course there was California, Arizona, Nevada had its case, so we had three states in there. And uh, I, I think we felt we need that much time. I don't think we were surprised when the court gave it to us. We were surprised, uh, you know, <laughs> with the eventual outcome, needless to say. We, we thought we, you know, from the way some of the questions from Justice Douglas and Harlan came down and, and the good argument Mike made, I think we were kind of optimistic that we might get it turned around, but we didn't. Now, one of the outcomes of the case was, of course, then that um, there had to be this determination or listing of present perfected rights. Mm. Um, were, were you involved in that? Well, let's see. The decree. After we had the uh, when we had the argument on the draft report for Judge Rifkin, you know, and he didn't make any changes after he drafted. Uh, I'm trying to think. He gave us a chance to <clears throat> tell him what he ought to do with his recommended decree. I don't know whether he did that when we had the argument on the draft report or whether he had a special session after his final report was out. I think we did it on the draft report. He kind of. Uh, leaned on us to make sure that the decree was, whether we liked its substance or not, whether we thought it was adequate to take care of uh, uh, the issues the way he had decided them. So the, uh, you know, then the, the uh, court handed down its decision in 63, and the decree came out in 64. Um, 
I didn't get involved. I, I left Mike's office in in uh, the end of '65, and even though the present perfected rights were were supposed to be decided within several years of the decree, as you know, that dragged on and never really got decided until 1977 because there were a lot of negotiations uh, between the states and the government and the Indian tribes on what the respective present perfected rights are at the, were at the time. And I think Doug Noble really handled the, the bulk of that for the state and I think with contributions from each of the agencies. I guess Bob Will was would have been involved at that during that period too in the early 70s when he was general counsel at MET. But I was off then. I'd moved on to the Public Land Law Review Commission where I was heading up the legal staff. And so I just know from reading and talking with people about what was involved there. So from late 1965 to Val Quinn, you really weren't, you, you had a hiatus from government right. matters. Beginning, I went with the Public Land Law Review Commission in uh, in January of uh, 65, 66, and I stayed with. They had a they were to stay. <coughs> the Land Commission was chartered by Congress to review all federal land and natural resources policy, and come up with change recommended changes in in policy for Congress and the President. And they were really scheduled to uh, go out of existence in. Uh, 68 sometime. They had a four-year life. Well, they got a late start, so they eventually got an extension of time, and the commission didn't wind up until uh, June of 1970. But I, Wayne Aspinall of Colorado was a chairman, and he asked me to stay on to the, the end until we had written the report and everything. So I did. I, I had not planned to stay that long, but I didn't feel like I could bail out in the middle of the commission's effort, which I strongly believed in. It was a challenging, interesting job, and I think the Commission did a good job. But So I stayed with the Land Commission until the, the middle of 70, and then I, uh, I went to a George Washington Law School as a visiting professor for about a year, uh, into, uh, well, into 71 sometime. And then I went with a, uh, uh, another law firm in town. Debo Boys and Liber <coughs> excuse me, which was primarily an electric utility firm, and I was not working on any Colorado River matters during that whole period from '66 to about <coughs> '72 or uh, three. And then Bob Will talked to me about uh, working on the, the Fort Hume Indian Reservation boundary dispute. Sometime, I think it may have been as late as 75, but perhaps in, in 74 sometime. So that was 25 years ago, and here we are yesterday having a meeting of all the council in Arizona against California trying to see if we can settle that very same dispute or whether we're going to have to litigate it. So it's hard to believe that on and off since about 75 I've been working on that same boundary dispute, which is the last issue to be resolved. In, Arizona against California. Uh, I think when most people think about Mike Ely, I mean, he's, he's got to be considered one of the most colorful characters. And, mm -hmm. of course, having been um, involved in the negotiations of the early contracts with the agencies and things like that, did he ever talk about those times and what it was like and how he banged heads or what he did to get people to agree? No, Mike never talked much about <clears throat> that. Of course, when I went with him, he was so heavily involved in Arizona against California, he, we really didn't have much time to talk about what he did uh, on the contracts. As, as most people know, Mike had gone to Stanford Law School, Stanford as an undergraduate in Stanford Law School, and he became very close friends so Mike was sort of a big man on campus in the 1920s. He became very close to Stanford President Ray Lyman Wilbur. So when who and Herbert Hoover was a Stanford alum also. So after Hoover was elected, he had persuaded Ray Lyman Wilbur to become Secretary of the Interior. Uh, Wilbur needed a 
someone he trusted and would be a strong right-hand man as a lawyer. Mike was practicing, I think he told me, admiralty law or something up in New York City. I think Mike got out of Stanford about 24 or 5 or 6, somewhere in there, and he practiced in New York for a while. And then, of course, uh, Wilbur became Secretary of the Interior in 1929. And, uh, and he brought Mike down as his right-hand man. And Mike, as you know, from all the documents that uh, Ken Hutchinson of Met's legal staff put together on the negotiation of the seven-party agreement and everything, Mike had the principal responsibility for uh, negotiating the water and power contracts under the Boulder Canyon Project Act. Mike never talked too much about this. But I know he didn't feel that having done any of that presented any conflict because seems to me he represented Imperial in the dispute over the 160-acre limitation, even though he or Ray Lyman Wilbur at Mike's instance had written a letter of some sort which opined on the question of whether or not the 160-acre limitation ought to imply to Imperial, and I think Mike, Mike, I think, was on the other side when it finally got up to the Supreme Court. But uh, well, Mike was so involved with all these Colorado River matters, it was hard to imagine in many ways. I don't know what the standard of ethics would have been. It was, it's hard to imagine that Mike could have gotten too involved uh, in litigation, certainly with the government, over the meaning of water and power contracts that he had personally negotiated. That, that always struck me as, as a, little, a little strange that that, that, that happened. But, uh, Anyhow, I mean, he had the wonderful reputation, he had a brilliant mind, I was very impressed with him, actually, uh, when, he, when he offered me a job to come back to Washington, my wife and I thought a great deal about it for a long time, because we liked California, where we were after Stanford, but uh, we had had our first uh, child, first grandchild of our two widowed uh, mothers and we were on kind of a guilt trip and felt we ought to go back east and be close to them so they could see the grandson and everything. So we did that. Mike said, well, come on back with my firm just for a year or two and then uh, I'm going to open an office in Los Angeles to carry on the Colorado River litigation and you can come back to California and head up that office and so forth. So I thought that was a nice compromise. Well, Mike never did open his California office as it turned out the Attorney General made a permanent little suite of offices available for Mike down in L.A. in the state building, and Mike used the state offices all the time. He never really needed a, his own office, and uh, and we got fond of Washington, so this, our original plans to come back to California just never came to fruition. Now, about 1975, then, you started representing Metropolitan. Right. Indian boundary right. disputes and the administrative process, I guess, with the Secretary right. of Order on Fort Yuma and so forth. Um, and then you also were retained by MET to start working on some Hoover energy mm -hmm. issues, the renewal of the Hoover power contracts. Right. Um, and my recollection is, um, I think that MET and DWP, who I think was represented by Mike Ely uh, at the time, were not always quite on the same page. Uh, on some of the issues uh, on the renewal of, of Hoover Energy. So that must have been kind of interesting to be yeah. on sort of the other side of the table from your, your former mentor. That's right. Well, Mike had not gotten involved at all in the, in the uh, Keishan Fort Yuma matter. Uh, just mention that, <coughs> excuse me, a moment because it was so interesting. I assume it, all, it will all come out in discovery and if we have to litigate the the Keishan claim, but uh, what had happened is that in the early, seven, in, in Arizona against California, the government had made a limited claim for the Fort Yuma Indian Reservation. There had been a boundary dispute years before the Secretary had determined that certain, some 25,000 acres of land were not part of the reservation in 1936, and based on that decision during Arizona against California, the government only made a claim for the other undisputed lands in the reservation. So in 63 and 64, we thought that was the end of the case. Uh, beginning in the early 70s, the tribe persuaded the uh, Klepe 
administration at Interior and the solicitor over there at the time to take another look at that boundary dispute and reverse the earlier 1936 so-called Margold opinion. That moved along down along the tracks very speedily and was the state parties in California and Arizona were given a chance to comment on on that proposed reversal and they, they objected to it but uh, they didn't feel like they had an adequate opportunity to, to make a good record before Secretary Kleppe. So Bob hired me to prepare a pretty comprehensive uh, set of arguments to present to the new solicitor. We got an extension of time to do that. So I did that and then uh, uh, Congressman Rhodes, who was I guess then the Speaker of the House, influential Republican, uh, talked to uh, demanded that Secretary Kleppe give the affected water users a chance to explain why the, the earlier opinion should not be overturned and, and, and be uh, indeed affirmed by the Kleppe administration. We had a we had a one-day hearing. We all sat around the room back in the interior and made arguments before Secretary Kleppe and Solicitor Austin. And uh, the next day the tribe came in and made their arguments and Solicitor Austin decided that he would not carry through with the proposed reversal of the earlier Margold opinion, but that he thought it was correct. Uh, the tribe prevailed on Senator Jackson, chairman of the Senate uh, Natural Res Energy and Natural Resource Committee, to hold some oversight hearings on what had happened, and, and uh, there were a number of Indian sympathizers, both among the Senate membership of the committee and certainly on the staff, and they they leaned very heavily on, the, uh, or complained very heavily to, to Kleppe and uh, Greg Austin, the solicitor, about what he had decided. So Greg thought he would write a formal solicitor's opinion to uh, lay out his reasoning, which he did, and he filed it in January of uh, 1977. When the new Democratic administration came in with uh, Secretary Andrus and his new solicitor, Leo Krulitz, the tribe, renewed its efforts to get, now they had to get Margold reversed and Austin reversed, and they they prevailed on the, the solicitor to do that, and he did uh, reverse the, the earlier solicitor's opinion and held that the, these disputed lands were part of the reservation. Who kind of spearheaded the uh, argument for the tribe? Well, I think, uh, you know, what was the lawyer's name who used to represent the tribe originally? Ray uh, Simpson. Ray, Ray Simpson. He was their lawyer. And he and he had a very sympathetic uh, social solicitor for Indian affairs uh, there under Kleppe. Uh, and uh, so they didn't have to do much arguing. And they had uh, sympathetic uh, folks in the, in the administration. And then after... Uh, Kleppe went out. I mean, they had sympathetic lawyers in the Kleppe administration. After Kleppe left, the same lawyers were there, and not the top solicitor, but the underlying associates. And uh, again, the tribe didn't have much trouble in uh, persuading them to overturn that earlier ruling. And as you know, that's where we are now. We're back, uh, back trying that whole issue, uh, maybe having to try it on the merits, although we hope we'll be able to settle with the tribe somehow. I think we had at least not a discouraging meeting yesterday. I think uh, the tribe's present council may be someone we can deal with, time will tell. But then though, okay, the Hoover power. Well, Mike had written all the regulations for the, the allocation of the the uh, power from Hoover, the firm power and the secondary energy and everything, and the uh, the rates were set under those regs uh, in a way that would recover for the government all the capital and operating costs of, of the dam for a 50-year period. <clears throat> and then at the end of the 50-year period, when the contracts were up, the secretary was supposed to kind of square the books and if the refunds, if, if the power users had paid too much, they would get a refund. If they hadn't paid enough, they'd have to ante up some more money. What well, turned out there was when they settled up the books whenever in 
I guess what, late 80s, 50 years from whenever the contracts were executed. See, me was maybe around 1990 or something. But uh, there were $25 million to be refunded. And the, uh, the question the, the secretary struggled with, now it had become the Secretary of Energy as opposed to the Secretary of the Interior because power marketing had been moved over to the Energy Department. Secretary of Energy decided to uh, distribute the uh, surplus revenues among just the firm contractors, which, because the firm contractors had really underwritten the project, they committed themselves, Met included, was the biggest purchaser of the firm. Power had committed themselves to pay for enough power to to fund the, or to recover the cost of the project, whether they used the power or not. And indeed, Met paid for a fair amount of power it never used in the early years. So uh, the, the formula the secretary came up with was one that uh, Met and the Arizona Power Authority and the Nevada Colorado River Commission, I guess, liked. The other uh, firm contractors were LA Department of Water and Power and Southern Cal Edison, or whatever it's called now. <laughs> and uh, they didn't like the formula because they thought they should have gotten more money back, that the, the overpayment should have been returned dollar for dollar to those who paid them. And Mike was representing uh, LA Water and Power. And uh, again, you know, having, he had been heavily involved in, in writing the regs <laughs> that we were litigating, the meaning of, and again, I was a little puzzled by that, but um, anyhow, Mike died in the, uh, during the litigation at the age of, I think, 92. He died with his boots on right, right in his office, and I think he was working on this Uber uh, refund case, but uh, anyhow, we, uh, we prevailed on that. We prevailed before. Well, we didn't prevail completely before the Court of Federal Claims, but we won most of what we wanted. And then uh, we didn't like a part of the uh, Court of Federal Claims decision, and L.A. and Edison didn't like any of it because they didn't get much, if at all, if anything at all. And so we took it up to the Federal Circuit, and they, uh, they uh, reversed the part of the Court of Federal Claims, the decision that uh, Med and Arizona and Nevada didn't like. So we ended up keeping all of our refunds, which you know, may have been nine, nine or more million dollars out of the 25, I can't recall. But anyhow, that was interesting. And I think we made a little bit of new law in the, in the federal circuit back there on, on the, uh, the way regulations, the secretary's interpretation of regulations is to be treated in a suit for breach of contract, which is essentially what Edison and L.A. brought. They claimed that the secretary had breached uh, their uh, power contracts. We said, no, the power contracts incorporated the regs. The secretary was given broad discretion in the regs, and he exercised it reasonably, and uh, that ought to be the end of it. And the Federal Circuit agreed. So that was a good, good win for the, part of the firm contractors. Did you also do some work from that on the renewal of the Hoover Power contracts? Oh, that's, yeah, in the early 80s when the contracts were coming up for renewal, I think, uh, well, at the time, I was doing work for Met, remember, in, in Arizona too. Uh, not quite as visibly <laughs> as, uh, as later on, but when, uh, when um, the government and the tribes filed in uh, 1970, December of 1978, to reopen the uh, decree in Arizona 1 to uh, award water rights for so-called omitted lands that they hadn't claimed water for and for disputed boundary lands, uh, Carl Baranke, who was, uh, he was not, uh, let's see, I guess Carl came out a little after that, but anyhow, Carl had me do a lot of work on the the uh, briefing of that case, and then, as you recall, we the lawsuit was companion lawsuit was filed in San Diego, and I helped you and Warren Abbott, I guess, on some of that briefing. So I was working throughout the early '80s of in Arizona too, but I wasn't 
I wasn't listed on the early briefs because Carl, nor was Carl, Carl had been a, you know, at the State Department of Justice, the California AG's office, and I had had that short period of six months as a deputy uh, attorney general when I started right out of law school, and there was someone in the California AG's office that said they didn't think it would be appropriate for Carl and me to participate on behalf of MET because MET might get into a conflict with the state on some issue and since we had worked for the state for some period it would be, a, they thought, maybe a conflict. Well, Carl and I sort of just went into the background for a while and I didn't do anything and then the, the administration changed and there was a new attorney general in California, I can't remember who it was, but they said forget about it, there's no problem. So then I think toward the end I started, my name was on some of the briefs and uh, and Carl was taking an active role. Of course, he be, had become a, a general counsel at Met by then. But in the, in the same period of the early 80s, the Hoover power contracts were coming up for renewal, and and uh, I worked, uh, I guess, with Fred Vending on doing a lot of briefing on what, on why our contracts ought to be renewed and why the restriction on uh, being able to, uh, uh, the restriction requiring us to use our power just to pump water into and in the aqueduct ought to be stricken. So I did a lot of uh, briefing administratively in the administrative proceedings, but then uh, they wound up and some lawsuits were filed and uh, Nevada and Arizona asked me if I would be interested in representing them in the litigation. Well, Carl hadn't uh, asked me to to help in the litigation at all, so I talked to him about it. And he said he just said he didn't want me to represent either Nevada or Arizona. And I said, "Well, are you going to use me for Met?" And he said, "Well, I don't know, but he said maybe or maybe not." And I said, "Well," so he decided the fair thing to do was to put me on a a retainer, so that since he didn't want me to to uh, to work for the other states and wasn't sure how much I could be involved on behalf of MET, at least I'd be getting some compensation for having foregone uh, working for the other states. So that was the, uh, that was in the early 80s sometime. That was the basis of my retainer, which lasted until uh, just a few months ago. <laughs> <laughs> and now I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm treated like all the other lawyers. I'm just uh, on an hourly basis. But I think uh, Carl felt, and Warren later, it was good to kind of keep me on a retainer so I'd be around to help on anything that they wanted. Now, did you get involved in drafting the legislation uh, on the Hoover renewal contract? Eventually there was federal no, legislation. No, I really didn't. Advanced. That was uh, that was pretty much all Bob Will, and I think Eddie Weinberg for Nevada and Bob McCarty for uh, for Arizona. No, I didn't. Somehow or other, I was out of the loop by then. You know, we had uh, we had filed all our administrative comments and so forth, and I think the lawsuit had been law several lawsuits had been filed, and I was uh, kind of on the sideline at the time on those. But uh, I didn't do any of that legislative drafting. Now, at some point in time, you partner up with Bob Will, right? Uh, and you form your own law firm and. Bob continues to do a lot of lobbying, representing different agencies, including the Colorado River Board and mm -hmm. Metropolitan and things like that. Um, one memorable piece of legislation, I think, uh, the All-American Canal Line legislation. I think you I did work participated on that. in that yeah. to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I remember about that. Let's try how we got Bob and I got together. Of course, I knew Bob. I had met him when he was just on the legal staff at Met, you know, at some point over the years. And then when he came back as uh, Met's lobbyist, I got to know him better. And uh, then after he left, we came back as Met's lobbyist, and then he went back to Sacramento as Met's lobbyist in Sacramento for a while, and Jerry Butcher was back here, and I think maybe even Ron Gastelum for some short period. Ron had been on Bob's legal staff for a while, went off somewhere else uh, ultimately. But um, uh, then Bob came back 
to Washington, not as a Met employee, but as I think he had retired from Met and he was just in, in private lobbying practice. And of course we saw a lot of each other and he worked on lobbying matters like drafting the Hoover renewal legislation and I was working in Arizona against California and boundary disputes and some of, the, some of these other legal issues. And uh, about 1987, uh, we were in the middle of the uh, San Diego litigation over the boundary disputes uh, and I was with the, I was running the Washington office of Holland and Hart, which was a Denver law firm. And the counsel for one of the tribes wrote me and said that he thought I should be disqualified from continuing to represent Met in the uh, San Diego litigation or in, if we went to the Supreme Court because one of my partners in the Denver office of Holland Hart was soli former solicitor Greg Austin who had written the, uh, the 1977 solicitor's opinion uh, which was favorable to our view of the uh, the proper boundary of the Fort Yuma Indian Reservation. Well, I I had talked to Greg Austin about that when he came back to Holland and Hart and he never had recalled working on uh, any of the boundary disputes, but he checked his files and lo and behold, uh, Scott McElroy, the counsel for the Colorado River tribes was correct because Greg had signed some papers during the present perfected rights negotiations and everything uh, supporting the tribe's claim. So uh, it was, I either had to leave Holland and Hart or give up Med as a client. So I left Holland and Hart because um, the state of Colorado at that time did not permit kind of building a, a wall between lawyers in the firm and partners who had been the government service, you know, so you would be insulated from conflicts. They didn't have that kind of liberal rule. They do now, but they didn't. So I left, uh, I decided I had to leave Holland and Hart and I was just tired of big law firms. I'd only, that was the only big law firm I'd ever been with. And of course I'd been with Mike and we never had more than half a dozen lawyers. And uh, that's the phone in the background. Um, Bob and I were working together in so many things that uh, we thought it might make sense to form a partnership. So we did in 87 and that lasted until 94 when Bob said he told Gene he was going to retire to San Diego and retire from active lobbying. They moved to San Diego, but obviously he hasn't retired from active lobbying. He's still he's back in Washington a couple weeks a month, but uh, and we still see each other a lot. Uh, but that's how we got together. And one of the things that you worked jointly on, though, was the, uh, oh, the legislation Canal. on the All-American Canal. That's right, and uh, we're trying to figure out at the time, uh, trying to think, uh, was Warren Abbott general counsel then? Because Carl, no, Carl and maybe Carl was general manager by then, but Myron was I, working on it. Right, so I think that means Carl had to have been the yeah, general, he was manager general manager because he hired Myron to come That's over right. to Matt. They were trying to figure out, uh, where I got involved was, uh, they were trying to figure out how they could uh, divide the the conserved water that was going to be made available by lining the All American Canal because you had the seven party agreement. Mm -hmm. And the obviously the the uh, ag users uh, felt that if water was conserved it ought to flow down through the priority system, even though Met might have paid for it. So I guess my assignment was to, uh, I wrote uh, most of the uh, the language used in the committee report justifying, uh, sort of giving anybody in any of the California agencies a first crack at paying for and getting the surplus water, but if they didn't, permitting Met to get it. And uh, I think that we had good basis for that. I think we probably could have gone further and Congress could have actually uh, superseded the seven-party agreement, said, well, we don't care what the agreement says, we're going to give the water to the party that pays for it. But anyhow, uh, 
And also, as you know, Imperial got the first option to do the job itself, which was a concession that uh, Met made and to Imperial, and Met made a few other concessions, I think, to Tom Levy on about what Coachella's rights might be in the surplus water, but that turned out to be, that language giving uh, Imperial first option turned out to be kind of a stumbling block for a while and, and I think delayed culminating some reasonable agreement for lining the canal and, and allocating the water, but uh, yeah, we did, I thought we, we had uh, some good legal basis for what, uh, what Congress provided in all American Canal legislation. Now, you <coughs> also have had the honor of being appointed by the Supreme Court as a special master mm -hmm. uh, in a water case. Uh, it, did that, working as a special master then and then being in a different, give you a different perspective of the Supreme Court and how it works? Well, yeah, I, I never knew, for example, how special masters operated and uh, I guess the, one thing I always like to tell, and I'm sure I told you this a couple of times, about how I got the appointment. I was sitting in my office in Washington one snowy day, and I was the only lawyer in there, and my secretary was the only secretary there, and she buzzed me and said that uh, uh, Justice White is on the phone. And I had, been, I had been working on a cert petition in another case, and I talked to a couple of my friends <coughs> about how I had to get around the decision that Justice White had to written and if I was ever have any chance of getting in the court on the cert petition. So I thought, well, which one of my friends are calling me now going to give me a bunch of malarkey about uh, this is Justice White and don't waste your time filing for cert. So anyhow, I uh, answered the phone. I said, yes. And he said, yes, this is, uh, this is Byron White. I said, oh, you know, kind of skeptical. And he said, you know, we get these, I remember he said, we get these pesky interstate water cases up here and he said, I, under, I understand from some people that you're, that you know something about interstate water issues. And he went on a little bit and he said, I'd like to talk to you about whether you'd be interested in that. And I thought, I couldn't recognize a voice as any of my friends and I said, is this really Justice White? He said, well, yes. And so I said, oh, well, excuse me. And so then he, we went on and he said, he'd, uh, that he, I had been recommended by Charlie Myers, Justice Judge Rifkin's former clerk, and that uh, if I didn't have any conflicts, why you'd like me to send my resume up and consider whether I'd like to do it. So I checked out and I, uh, I didn't have any conflicts. I thought I might have one conflict. I had, I had, uh, I had contributed when I was with Holland and Hart to kind of a partner's uh, slush fund for political candidates, and one of them had been the then governor of New Mexico, and the case that White, Justice White was talking to me about was uh, Texas and Oklahoma against New Mexico, and I thought, well, it might look not right that I maybe, if someone there, if I get appointed special master and someone says, well, look, this Jerry Mize gave $100 to the governor of New Mexico, and so forth. So I told White about that, and he said, he said, you mean just, you gave $100 to go to a cocktail party for the governor? I said, yeah. You know, I said, you know, came out of the firm's uh, fund and so forth. And I said, I've never had any contact with him since. He said, well, if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. So he said, just forget about it. So that's the way it started. And then as we move along through the case, if I had questions, I'd call the deputy clerk. And sometimes I'd talk with Justice White uh, directly. But uh, I guess... The main feeling I had about the whole episode is how much more fun and satisfying it is to be in a quasi-judicial role actually deciding something rather than just being an advocate on one side or the other. Okay, go ahead. Um, anyhow, I like that judicial role much better because uh, when you're representing a client, you know, what, no matter what you think may be the optimum, most equitable solution to a problem, you're, you're committed to making your best effort for your client's position. And sometimes you may not feel completely comfortable with that or, or whatever, but uh, when you're in this judicial role, though my decision was just a recommendation to the court, 
you have the opportunity to move things around and kind of affect a compromise that you'd like to think keeps everybody relatively happy. So that's what I liked about it most. I'd like to do it again sometime. <laughs> um, did at the, well, at that time, did, was Justice White, for some reason, was he in charge, so to speak, of He was in charge of picking, special yes. masters, or? I think so. I think he had that assignment because he had picked Charlie Myers, and then he had picked Owen Olpen to handle the North Platte reopened decree on, in uh, Nebraska against Wyoming, which, by the way, they just settled a few weeks ago. The Supreme Court approved the settlement in that case. And then Charlie had recommended me, so he called me. So White had picked the three of us in over a couple year period for the three cases, three water cases that had come up to him. Now, as a special <coughs> minister, after your report goes up to the court and mm -hmm. the court comes down with a decision, do you have any more contact with the court? I mean, do, do they call you and thank you for your service or? Uh, no, they really, well, usually the final, Decree says uh, something like the, the decree is entered with special thanks to the special master, but somehow I got shortchanged. <laughs> my my name wasn't even mentioned in the court's opinion in in Texas and uh, Oklahoma against New Mexico. Although I looked at, at other uh, decisions sometime, they don't always mention your name. Maybe it depends on who's writing the uh, the opinion. Maybe they don't think it's appropriate to mention that Joe Dokes was appointed special master. They just some of the cases, as did mine, say a special master was appointed. So if you're intrigued about who the special master was, you just go look at the order they cite for appointing a special master. But no, uh, I've talked. To, I've talked to the uh, the deputy clerk of the court quite a bit. We're kind of good friends, and sometimes I ask him about other cases that are pending up there and so forth. But no, I never. The only. Uh, acknowledgement I ever had that I was even working on the case other than talking with Justice White. If I had a problem was I was at a reception up there for something other than I saw Justice Scalia who I had known for a number of years. We had, when I was with the Public Land Law Review Commission he was a rookie law professor down at the uh, University of Virginia Law School in the late 60s and I was supervising a contract study down there and I got to know him fairly well and then later he was chairman of the American Bar Association's administrative law section the same year I was chairman of the natural resources law section, so we worked together a fair amount. So we got to know each other. We weren't bosom buddies, but good acquaintances. And I saw him up there and uh, at a reception. He said, well, I see we finally got you working for us. And I said, yeah, I appreciate the work. Thanks. <laughs> that was about it. Well, as you, as you look back on, what, 30, 40 years of Involvement in one way or another on Colorado River matters. Mm -hmm. What's your, what's your most memorable uh, moment? Hmm. Well, it was all, you know, it was all very challenging and fast. And first of all, it was, it was great to uh, work with a, you know, an intellect and. Uh, such a good advocate as Mike Ely. Mike, as many people know, was not, did not have much success with his law firms. He had kind of a 19th, I'd say not even 20th, 19th century view of how law firms ought to operate. Mike was a senior partner and all the rest were, he, uh, he never had a, a, a view of, of partners kind of sharing the firm. So that was something that I was not happy with, but working with him, I mean, I think it was invaluable, and to see him in action and see that mind at work and what he accomplished, I think that's uh, that's something I was, uh, he was really a good mentor for me, so I think out of all this, having worked with him made me a far better lawyer than I think I would have been if I would have, I thought for a while about going into some of the big firms in L.A. I had offers down there and up in San Francisco when I was getting ready to graduate, but I think I would have ended up, you know, doing some menial, rather non-interesting work, and uh, I just love working in the in the natural resources field. Um, I guess what I, what I use my Colorado River experience for in, in most cases, when I'm talking, when I'm teaching students 
I've taught for a long time down at UVA. I'm, I hope to resume teaching water law down there next year, uh, University of Virginia, is that I always cite our experience on the Colorado as evidence that litigation really doesn't produce very much. I mean, we've been at it 50 years now on the Colorado and uh, hasn't produced one more drop of water. And I think if all the uh, time and effort and money and, and dedication or anything that went into all this litigation had been focused on trying to figure out some equitable settlement with uh, Arizona at some point, why it would have been <laughs> much more productive. And so uh, that's why when I was special master, those states of Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico were so antagonistic, and there was never, any, when we started out, there was never any hope of getting them to agree to anything. And uh, later on, when we got one of the, when my report was approved by the court, but they remanded one issue to me that I hadn't decided, I was able to, to uh, work with them and get them to settle that issue, and they all were very appreciative. All the council thanked me, and I think that was, you know, that was kind of a, a legacy from my Colorado River experience that continually litigating issues is not the way to solve uh, questions about how to share a common resource like water. You know, in a few minutes, Sherry, we're going to go downstairs and hear a panel that's going to talk about uh, their vision oh, of that's the right. Colorado River in, in the future. Um, what's your vision? I mean, if you look out 10, 15 years from now, I mean, mm. There are so many issues, uh, as we know, that are at a crossroads uh, as we speak. Um, things could be very different in 10 or 15 years. Well, I think, I think we will, of necessity, or just through belated awareness, come to have a, a, a different view of how to manage resources. I'm not, I've, over the years, uh, I've not been, I used to be convinced that you know, allocations, quantitative allocations were important and you protected them and certainty and everything was critical, but uh, I like the idea of having a more flexible system of some sort. I think we need, I, I spend a lot of my time when I get asked to present papers on talking about new institutional arrangements where the all the parties will get together if they're interstate issues where not just the states will get together, but the Indian tribes will be represented on some kind of a, a management entity and that uh, rather than trying to uh, live with outmoded elements such as the compact on the law of the river and so forth, you have something like adaptive management, you have certain equitable principles that all the parties agree on to about what to do in times of shortage and, and how to make fair allocations about higher value uses and things of that sort. So I think it'll be inevitably a much more cooperative kind of, a, uh, in a way, sacrificial uh, management that doesn't rely so much on individual states' rights and what their entitlement should be. The, the region will be viewed as a region and what's best will, for the region will determine how the water is managed and if certain parties give up uh, rights or equities will be compensated in some fashion or dealt with fairly and I think that's what we have to come to in the long run Probably not in my lifetime Well, I don't know, you know <laughs> I, 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 I've been sitting here thinking I'd really like to talk to you again in five years or, or so when I think some of uh, Some of the issues will be put to bed because there are so many things that you worked on uh, particularly in your representation of Matt that I, I think would be great to talk about. I mean, you know, the banking opinions, the uh, discussions <laughs> with, you know, over the rights to transfer, you know, and, and uh, working on uh, San Luis Rey matters and things like that. All of those things which are still kind of in the mix and so yeah. not really appropriate uh, for public discussion, but um, certainly, I mean, I, and I just marvel at all of the people that that you were able to work with. I mean, they're really all the, you know, they're all the names that, well, that you read about. It's all been, you know, an enriching experience for me. It's been a privilege, and 
as people say, a privilege and a pleasure to have worked with a lot of them, including yourself. We had a number of good years and more recent times working on these Colorado River matters. And uh, I wouldn't try, I think natural resources work is the most interesting, exciting kind of practice you can have. And uh, I'm so glad that somehow or other Mike Ely led me into it and I decided to stick with that. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Thank you very much for <laughs> My your pleasure. Time. Thanks for talking to me. <laughs>